So welcome back everybody. Today three, final day of our Mobi workshop and we will start with the gate biomechanics presented by Bettina Wallesen and Uroš Marusic. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. Please, Betty, stage is yours. To start, yes. thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to present you today some insights about gate and biomechanical biomechanical analysis. And um, I will do this together with Uroš Marusic, um, who will take over the second part. So what do we want to do? Um, I can't change the slides to the next slide, so some technical issues. Ah, what we want to do today is that I first um, will take um, you with me and give you some insights about biomechanics of the musculoskeletal system and especially biomechanics of gait. And um, in the second part, we will have a hands-on session where Urush will show you how you um, can further um, yeah, detect gait events out of the pre-processed gait data, like looking at the asymmetries and the step lengths and also the data preparation preparation or preparation for the MOBI related research. And um, within the theoretical aspects, I will um, show you some coupling between gait and cognitive control from a biomechanical perspective. We'll introduce you into the spatial temporal gait parameters and according normative data, give you an overview about um, ongoing and um, mostly chosen gait measurement systems and then I will lead you to the biomechanical parameters for the gate analysis towards the MOVI approach. So the learning goals within our sessions are the knowledge about the relevant spatial temporal gate parameters, the ability to distinguish between what is a more normal harmonized stable gate pattern that you might identify within your data and what might be pathological gate and um, what kind of other parameters you have to integrate if you want to do further um, analysis, maybe about stability parameters, or um, if you want to do um, some distinguishing between like normal and pathological gait. So within the biomechanics, we have a lot of sub areas that might be of interest in research. And as you can see, the biomechanics are as um, far differentiated as a lot of aspects in cognitive science or um, cognitive research. And within the biomechanics, we have like um, aspects of tissues and organs, we have human movement, and we have also um, aspects of orthopedic research, of rehabilitation research, but also exercise sports and um, exercise and sports biomechanics or aspects of occupational health. And these again can um, be more differentiated what we need to talk about today, like what do we need for human movement analysis within our ideas of the MOBI approach and what kind of biomechanics do we need? If we want to look at kinematics and kinetics, this will be further addressed um, in Urush part. And what do we need um, regarding something like a functional anatomy, uh, anatomy um, especially when we look at um, gait patterns? And within the biomechanical research, there is a lot of progress going on. As you can see here in the um, left picture, there are many, many approaches that try to um, capture the motion of the participants while walking or other daily movements um, within a lot of kind of different measurement systems. We will um, talk later on about that. And also combining this with other relevant measurements, like what are the muscles doing while we are walking within this um, big kind of area? And what is the, the reference or the answer of the muscles to the movements of the body and the joint ankles? And what we try to um, yeah, support is that we make this measurements easier and easier and maybe transfer it into um, 
measurements within smartphones and all these things, but also use these kind of um, research results for daily activity. And as I told you that also biomechanics are relevant for occupational health. Here you can see what might be done in the future. You can see within this video over here that this kind of motion capturing can bring models into persons who are um, doing the working task. And what you also can see within this video is that when you wanted to do something like an um, ergonomic, um, ergonomic, uh, um, yeah, idea about what the person is doing, then you can see that the green, um, the, the green part of the body within this video refers to these are um, good and normal movements and everything what's going or what will be yellow and red refers to that these are discomfortable uh, movements that might be um, yeah, leading to musculoskeletal disorders. Therefore, um, biomechanics are helpful to understand the nature of movement control and disorders. And we will um, be able in the future to add into this model and into these kind of videos, as I showed you, or that I showed you, also the angles and uh, maybe muscle and heart rate um, activity and all this stuff. But I wanted to focus on the biomechanics of gay today because this is what we have in our data. So I will switch to this. And um, GATE is here seen as um, a medical term to describe the locomotive movement of walking. And um, there are a lot of complex aspects that need to be addressed when you want to look at these kind of biomechanics of GATE. And as you can see in the picture here is that depending on the walking speed, the body needs to um, relate the, the joint ankles and also the muscular activity to the nature um, of the speed that needs to be conducted. So if there is like free choosing normal walking speed or if there is fast speed, this means that there might be difference in um, what needs to be integrated and um, coordinated within the whole body, muscular and skeletal system to um, conduct this movement of um, daily activities. So the biomechanics of gait are closely related to what has happened within the joint ankles and according or accompanying muscular activity. So as you can see in this picture that when we have like the walking um, system within like a model of the, the foot and the um, accompanying angles, um, then we have in relation to how fast we are walking or if we are walking or running, related muscular activity, which might be different, or which is um, really different between these um, two different kind of movements. And from a motor control perspective, we have to look at the gait cycle duration. We have to look at the different um, phases of this walking cycle or of this gait cycle. And we have to look at what is happening um, within this gait um, cycle according to amplitudes and um, activation. And this is like um, together with, with the responses of the musculoskeletal system. And this might be, or this is really um, different between walking and running. I know you saw this slide before yesterday or something like this slide, it's a bit different. But um, as I told you, to coordinate this um, movement in the musculoskeletal system, we have to integrate a lot of aspects and we have to do a lot of cognitive processes. And therefore, it's so um, important to um, go on and do further research within the mobile approach. So while we are walking, which um, should be something like an automatic movement, um, a lot of aspects needs to be integrated and processed in the brain. So we have a lot of cognitive processes regarding the voluntary movements. 
we have a lot of sensory signals that needs to be integrated into um, our walking pattern. And these are um, like the, the yeah, building the cognitive reference um, of what we need to do, like the integrating of the sensory signals and the voluntary movements, but also emotional processes and motor behavior are relevant to um, show if you are um, being in the, in the right direction. And there are a lot of aspects then that might disturb a stable um, gait patterns and um, um, yeah, might um, lead to cognitive motor interference. And if you have a closer look at the cognitive processes of gait, then you can see that there are a lot of processes going on in the cortical structures, like looking at the frontal lobe in the prefrontal, um, prefrontal cortex and the RCC. And these refer mainly to executive function. And this is why a lot of um, persons try to disturb gait patterns in dual task situation with tasks that um, refer to executive function like um, working memory or um, um, attentional or divided attentional control. And in the subcortical areas, there we have the motor control aspects and patterns that also um, are relevant um, to um, refer to the different kind of cognitive processes that needs to be um, conducted during gait cycles. But I wanted to give you more impressions about the biomechanics, so the, the cortical processes and what's going on um, are like um, coming maybe in Martin's part. And um, what we need to look at is that we have to describe the gait cycles when we look at the biomechanics to different kind of aspects. First, we have the event that are results by the foot, like the initial foot contact, the, the heel strike, the toe off, the heel rise, and um, again, the, the movements that are necessary to um, yeah, move forward. And this can be integrated or differentiated in different kind of periods, like we have loading response, we have the mid stance, the terminal stance, and the swing phases. And these are accompanied by the tasks that the body system has to control and integrate like the weight acceptance, the single um, limb support, and the limb advancement. And therefore, if we wanted to integrate the, the gait into phases, then we have a stance phase and a swing phase. And together, the stance phase and the swing phase are the whole gait cycle. And these gait cycles are accompanied with um, central spatial temporal gait parameters. And these parameters can be classified into parameters that describe the rhythm of the gait, like the double support time, meaning how long are both foot on the floor, and the cadence, meaning how many steps you can um, do per minute. Um, and of course, this is um, dependent on the gait speed. And there are the parameters of pace which are according to speed and stride lengths, which are the main common variables um, to describe um, normal gait patterns. And yeah, you can see that the stride lengths describe the, the um, distance from heel strike of one extremity to the next heel strike of the same extremity. And um, together of both feet, we will have these kind of gait cycles. Moreover, there are other relevant gait parameters, and a lot of um, researchers describe gait vari variability, um, for example, of the step or the stride length to show if something like disturbances from the outside have an influence or an impact of the on the gait patterns, and um, to show that maybe with this um, disturbances or under dual task conditions, there might be something like a change within the gait patterns. And this is um, yeah, a paradigm that needs to help to train um, non-automatized gait functions again, for example, in older age. 
We also have to look at the arm swing because um, the arm swing might also be affected by um, yeah, some kind of diseases or um, pathological gait patterns. We have to look at the hip and the pelvis rotation and um, the foot placement and the rotation of the foot. And as you can see in the picture down here on the slide that um, especially Parkinson's disease is one example where you have a lot of um, different aspects according to the gait that is changing within um, yeah, the pathologies of the Parkinson disease. To look at um, the, the gait parameters from our approach, like detecting um, heel strikes and, um, for example, foot rolling movements, um, we mostly start from the um, basis of ground reaction forces. And what you can see on the left is that um, we need to integrate or we need to identify the heel strike on the first place and the um, load that is um, forced by the heel strike on the first plate and then what is going on with the whole foot rolling movement to understand what a gait cycle and the gait pattern for one foot might be um, integrated. And as you can see in the picture here on the right side is that there are different um, forces that will be conducted from the foot and the whole body segments during the heel strike and then the flat, flat foot with the double support time and then the forefoot placement when the um, foot will again take off to um, do this kind of moving forward or ongoing movements. Looking at normative data of the common spatial temporal gait parameters, um, we can find that um, there are a lot of um, research or that there is a lot of research out there about gait speed and gait velocity. And um, 1.2 meters per second until 1.5 meters per second are the main common gait velocity that all of us will um, will um, induce when we are do like normal walking outside. And um, this is also accompanied by the stride length of a gait cycle um, according to the right and the left step, which means this is a double step. Um, the accompanying gait, um, uh, the, the accompanying step length and the cadence as referring steps per minute. And of course, all these parameters are related to gait speed. And um, we also need to be aware that the stride lengths and the step lengths are related to the leg lengths or the body height. Because um, if we are taller and have longer legs, then of course the step lengths might be um, greater than um, if you are smaller. And this is a, a main aspect that need to be reported. And um, a lot of um, researchers sometimes do not reflect on this. So if we want to report on gate parameters, we um, should integrate the anthropometric data. When we want to look into the data set about comparison of older and younger adults and reflect on what we will see in the hands-on session, then we need to be aware that gait will change um, with increasing age. And this is um, one result of a lot of, lot of, lot of influencing factors, as you can see within this picture. Like with increasing age, the neural control of the locomotor system and therefore the neural control of gait um, is dependent on many influencing factors according to what is happening in the uh, muscles like deconditioning of skeletal and cardiac muscles. It's um, referring to flexibility, but also to um, pain and maybe also to reductions in the um, visual and vestibular um, proprioception and also previous falls might have an impact. And <clears throat> therefore it's no, um, not surprising that um, gait parameters will change while aging. 
So we have a reduced gait speed of 16% per decade from people who are older than 80. And um, this is like um, leading to reductions within gait speed. And one side effect is that you might be aware of that 1.2 meters per second are necessary to participate in ongoing traffic because this is the gate speed that you need to cross the street during uh, an ample phase, um, during a green ample phase. And um, we also observe some kind of um, different gate patterns with increasing age. We have an increased step width and we have a reduced step length in older age. And um, a lot of researchers say that the main cause why this occurs is um, the loss of muscle mass, maybe according to sarcopenia. And um, this will also um, integrate a lot of um, these accompanying changes. But um, when you heard the talk by Dan Ferris yesterday, then um, I agree with him that these kind of changes might be occur earlier and um, are not only depending on the loss of muscle mass. I think that um, a lot of problems within the um, proprioceptive system and a lot of um, problems of stimulus intake from the, the, um, yeah, from the environment, especially visual motor aspects are um, happening before and that they also have a high impact on on the gait patterns of older adults. So it might be interesting to look at the dual task effects on gait patterns. So what will happen if we have to do different kind of um, task at the same time, which is also happening in daily traffic as we heard yesterday. And um, I, I already referred that um, gait stability of older adults is described by step length, step width, and cadence. And um, these are pretty different between older and younger people and between fallers and non fallers And under dual task conditions, an increase in the gait variability um, will occur and the step lengths will, reduced, will be reduced. And um, the dual task situation that will um, integrate a lot of cognitive demand and a lot of attention will have the most destabilizing effects um, on older adults and especially on fallers. So I would be happy to um, do further research to, to look what is happening during the stimulus intake, what is um, happening during the cognitive um, processing and resource allocation and what is happening during um, motor execution of um, these populations with older adults and um, how are fallers and non-fallers are um, yeah, differing in these kind of um, cognitive processing. We looked in um, our data in a recent study, which is under review, um, what happens if younger and older adults walk under single task and dual task conditions? In this case, like looking in a dual task um, condition that is naming anim animals, it's a working memory verbal fluency task. And here we can see that we have a large um, effect on um, how fast is the velocity while single task and how is the velocity while dual tasking. And this is um, obvious and older and younger adults. And sometimes we have conflicting results because the older adults are already starting um, from a um, lower yeah, walking speed so that um, they will have more dual task effects than younger adults. And what we need to be aware of if we look into or if we um, yeah, preview our hands-on session that a dual task, uh, which in, integrates a visual component, might be more interfering. And um, Urus will come back to this in his part of the talk. OK, so these are the main aspects that we need to be aware of when we are looking at um, the combination of um, gate-related aspects and um, MOBI measurements. 
And um, when we look at how we can measure these kind of um, gay patterns, then there is a lot of, lot of measurement systems out there um, which, are, um, which can give you different kind of information. So first, there are a lot of treadmill um, systems that um, can show you um, gay patterns. And if there are sensors integrated, then um, these um, yeah, treadmill measurements can give you the, the gate var variables um, during um, real-time measurements. This can also be done by these motion capturing systems using um, maybe a Riken system or a quality system. And there are a lot of overground walking systems um, like the OptoGate or these Zebras measurements and of course, there are variable sensor systems using accelerometers and IMUs to show us um, different kind of walking patterns. Depending on what we wanted to add into our research, we can um, distinguish between simple measurements and complex measurements. So the simple measurements are mostly done isolated and can give us time-related aspects um, and allow a large number of participants, we can look at global gate parameters like speed or velocity, the time and distance parameters, ground reaction forces, and maybe also referring to something like energy expenditure or something like that. And in the complex measurements, we might um, integrate more um, aspects into these digital video systems, camera systems, and motor motion capturing. Um, combining these measurements with EMG or other aspects of multidimensional force plates. This allows a smaller number of participants because these are like highly complex and um, take a lot of time to prepare the participants. Um, but we will have the opportunity to look at movement strategies. We have to, or we can look at global functional parameters and we can ask questions about core problems of movement disorders, compensational strategies, or maybe also modeling some aspects. It's mainly common that these kind of inertial measurement systems are um, more developed because it's so um, easy to look at um, measurements and integrate them into our smartphones. And then we have our measurement device with us. Therefore, a lot of research is trying to further um, improve the quality of these IMU measurements within our smartphones. And um, by now we have good quality of accelerometer measurements and maybe also gyroscope measurements, but the um, advantages or opportunities from magnetometers or barometers are still um, very low and not that um, good in the, the detection of the quality of the, the data. And when we do this with these um, inertial measurements, um, we um, are still trying to identify um, the heel strike as the start of the gate cycles. We have some limitations, but we also have some good um, details with the, the um, systems that we have at the moment. And what we need to know, and this is um, relevant to the, the, to the hands-on session and to what we get within our data at the moment when we do this um, measurements here, is that we have the position dates, uh, data of the foot, we have the velocity, we have the acceleration and the jerk, which will be further um, analyzed and calculated in um, the specific calculation units. Within these data, we will look at nearly the ankle positions, like what is happening when the heel strike starts, what um, will going on during the whole gait phase, um, how can we describe the stabilization phase, like the foot flats, as I told you before, and what will be ha what will happening when the foot takes off for um, the next um, gait cycle or the next swing phase? So we can um, observe <coughs> the angle motions. We can observe maybe something like the joint power or the joint velocity. 
and this will um, be detected like what is happening in maybe toe off phases, mid swing phases, the heel strike and the loading response and these are um, data from from angular rates of the foot um, but you can also look at what is happening within the acceleration data in the x set and y axis and how we can detect in our data set um, the acceleration um, no the, the angular rates um, in the x axis for the show off or the heel strike so here you can see how um, these detected gait cycles in the data set might look like dependent on the measurement system that you might have used. So this is the point where I um, need to stop and give over to, to Urush because I now showed you what you might expect from your data and what are the, the main gait patterns are that you look like or that you have to look at. And I'm transferring to my partner, Urush. Ah, sorry. But um, before moving on, do we want to take some questions for Betty? Or will what? there be another? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome, because um, I see a question on Zoom chat now from Savannah. Um, would you like to speak up or should I read your question to you? All right, then. So, um, so yeah, there's the question that many dual tasking studies use tasks that only rely on neural systems that are quite separate from sensory motor regions, e.g. attentional, linguistic, memory. Do you know of dual tasking studies? Which in which the task of doing walking, also motor related finger tapping, counting, etc. Um, yes, I know a lot of these studies. So we um, distinguish the, the dual task um, taxonomy into this kind of like working memory task um, with um, um, like doing calculations or doing naming an animals or um, doing motor dual tasks like carrying a tray or um, carrying a glass of water or like um, putting a coin from, from one side to the other side. And these kind of um, additional motor tasks are mostly more conflicting than um, these attentional um, or linguistic tasks. Did this answer your question? Yes, it is. So, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> we, we, at the moment, we are conducting a, a huge systematic review about these kind of dual task taxonomy within um, GATE and healthy older adults. And there are like, 130 studies that we need to sort. And so at the moment we are um, doing the data ex extraction and maybe at the end of the year, we will have the paper out, hopefully. Okay, and then there's another question from Marius on chat. Oh, no, wait a minute. How about <laughs> tossing coin to you? Oh, sorry, I, I thought it was a question. <laughs> I mean, it is a question. Um, is are there any other questions that uh, you would like to direct to Betty now? Then you can just unmute yourself and speak. Um, if not, then I have a question uh, for myself. So uh, you are showing this uh, slide about um, acceleration dif uh, around different axes, and. Um, does the algorithm that you use to um, detect features from the gate data, does this um, depend on how you placed the accelerometers? Um, yeah, um, I would prefer for future research that we look in um, how the, the biomechanics um, research define the X, Y, and Z action, as I showed you on the slide with the force plate. And um, if we would do this, 
um, together all, all together in the future, then we will have more comparable data and less problems to um, interpret um, what we what we can see. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree. Um, what is your trick to deal with this within your study? So, um, do you have do you just um, instruct um, the um, experimenters, or do you just yeah. make sure that yeah. it's about the same placement? Yeah. Yeah, we need to, to be aware in the beginning uh, when we do the setup for the measurements that we clearly clearly predefine what is X, Y, and Z. Oh, that's really good to know. So when you start data collection, I might be around to see how <laughs> this is done. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, are there any more questions to Betty? If not, then yes, uh, let's hand it over to Urosh. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, thank you, you're welcome. Good morning, uh, everyone. I, I guess I, I was very relaxed until the moment I saw Benedict with his, his daughter. So I'm hoping she's not asking any questions. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, I am I'm, uh, very pleased to be here today with you and um, trying to um, continue this session um, in a very honest way. So um, it would be um, a misleading a bit um, a starting point saying that uh, what I'm going to show, it's a, a perfect thing that uh, works completely fine and uh, you can use it for your next studies but perhaps we can take it from the perspective of um, taking this data, like not measuring them and orientating uh, yourself uh, just by simply plotting them. So you, you take different, uh, different uh, sections, you plot them on uh, one above the other, and then try to uh, understand what is, what is it behind. So you have um, uh, all the data. So just let me try to move here. Um, yeah, so we, we are we are starting now with the hands-on. Uh, I think it's um, in general um, the the routine or the code. You you'll, you'll see it. You, you have two um, two functions, one that calls the other one, and what you basically need to do is switch the path, and it's ready to uh, plug and play basically. So um, I, I will walk you through uh, the routine, and then if there are any suggestions how to do it better. We are open and, of course, like Sane said, um, to, to optimize the, the future uh, studies. So what I'm going to show you today is the data that you've been working with um, and you will work also in the next session with Martin. So my part or the part of this session is now to basically extract the feature that we will use then later on with uh, Martin and analyze EG related um, uh, so gate related EEG or cortical activity, right? So we basically, right, for, for now, we need just the events, which will mark a certain um, uh, event in the gate cycle, as Betty nicely showed previously, uh, and this should be repetitive. So since gate, it's like, as you know, a uh, repetitive pattern, uh, so in at least uh, not a pathological one, uh, then you'll see uh, some patterns which are coming and going, coming and going. And these features are going to be extracted um, today. Uh, so we are currently here. Uh, Sane did a wonderful introduction for the motion uh, preparation. So if there are any questions how that was pre-processed, I guess um, Sane can answer uh, about that and together with Marius. Um, we are taking this data which were previously pre-processed and making um, out uh, the, the preparation for the uh, Martin's part. So as I told you, um, like in between, when, when I'm showing the code, you can, I hope you already uh, downloaded it, but if you didn't, you can try to do it now. So you have here four data sets um, and uh, also inside um, um, the day three, so for the scripts, scripts, you have like four of them. The first two are mine. I guess you'll see my name, not me. Um, and then the two others are from Martin. So um, yeah, just a, a quick comment. In my uh, code, you'll see that 
I was coding still with the folder five mocap. It was named previously like that, but you can simply change to, to six single subject motion analysis. And then it should work, as I said. Uh, we had some previous issues with uh, plotting, but we commented uh, those rows. So I think it should work from one, uh, 2019 onwards. Uh, I'm talking about MATLAB version. Um, Okay, so to start with a bit the orientation. So, so far, um, I guess you, you got a nice overview of what biomechanics is. Um, and um, just to like, we do this orientation in a vector space, right? From what is right orientation, what is left, taking right and uh, left hand. Usually I wanted to just give you two examples and then uh, I promise these are very uh, short. Uh, but just to, to see where we are currently. So if I show you this picture, um, I usually ask my students, what do they see here uh, on this picture? And I get really interesting answers. So you would, wouldn't believe what they see, but actually, yeah, I'm not talking about that part. I'm talking about biomechanics, of course. And this um, is kind of like the, the picture that I wanted to, or I want to know if you know what is it presented after checking the Betty speech. And then on the other side, there's another picture, a very old one as well. Uh, so these are two first pictures uh, that were presented. And I'm wondering if you know what are they showing? Um, perhaps we can take like um, 30 seconds, but um, otherwise I'll, I'll just uh, continue. Um, so, yeah, if you if you can can check and not to miss or not to to mix uh, the mix the the, the uh, two two uh, features, the signals can look very similar. Is the the uh, key message here? So if we are taking the left uh, picture, you see some trend like zero going up, then a bit down, and then up and then down. So you have certain pattern here, right? That is exchanging. But what I'm showing on this picture, it's nothing that we will use later on, although it's gonna be similar signal um, plotted. So here on this picture, I'm showing, I'm not sure if there are any uh, comments, but um, yeah, it's, let me check, an elephant, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So it's um, kind of um, a pattern, a repetitive pattern of force, grand reaction force that was recorded back in uh, 19th uh, century. Um, and then on the right side, it's the, um, so the kinematics yeah. um, where you can, sorry, Anna. Okay, uh, I thought that sh that was the answer. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so that's on the right side is the uh, kinematics. So if we, if I uh, sum up this, this was from um, Gaston Carlet, uh, the first recorded grand reaction force. So we are recording the force like the, the, that um, makes like a force uh, with, the, with the ground. And then you see that the response, and then you have a heel strike, mid step, and then the toe off, right? But that's measuring forces, nothing that we will do today. And then we have below for the picture from Otto Fischer, which was also the first uh, here, I'm showing the 2D, 2D um, kinematics, where you can nicely see uh, how these patterns are going up and down. So this is the, the center of body mass, right? How is going up and down due, during this repetitive pattern of walking and also other uh, trajectories of, um, you see here like the um, uh, hip, uh, the knee and the, the ankle. So you can extract from those, those figures already, um, you know, lots of, lo lots of information. Um, okay, so let's continue on. Um, and here we come to the, the, the main question, right? What we want to extract, what we want to use as a system to extract feature and then use it for, for in a MOBI uh, approach, right? For, for the EG uh, analysis. So we, like years ago, we published this study um, with the foot switches. So you, in, and in this case, it would be very nice to have foot switches only, not needing uh, all the other um, um, position of the, the um, electrodes uh, or the, the markers. Um, and what, what you basically uh, extract here is like just the, the pressure when, when the, the, the body or the, um, you know, the, the center of the whole body mass 
um, made this pressure on the certain area. So you see the signal going up. And then when is the, uh, the mid phase or the swing phase, then there is nothing uh, pressuring on, on this specific point. So you don't get the signal. So you would get like a repetitive, again, on off responses. And that's something it would be completely enough for what we are trying to do here right, today. So we, we actually want to have a repetitive pattern and those events very concisely and very precisely um, uh, made and, and marked, uh, and then you know, extracted to the, uh, inside the uh, uh, structure that Martin will call and then make some um, uh, event-related potentials or uh, as you will see, motor cortical um, related potentials. Um, uh, Lash, so, just, yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Um, but uh, do you are you doing something with the cursor? Then uh, could you uh, change your uh, cursor to a laser pointer? Oh yeah. Uh, thanks. Ah, uh, so like if you are hovering your ma uh, mouse in the upper monitor, then it's not visible. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. Uh, Thank you. Mouse. Yeah. And then uh, where's the pointer? Yes. Uh, so here you see it, right? Okay. So yeah, um, here we have these this, uh, events and they, they are nicely represented here. So let me jump now to the, the, the our hands-on. Um, and here, um, yeah. So here you, you, you saw the setup we had. So that there were like 31 cameras. Uh, we had um, like um, several rigid bodies and from head to left tight, lower leg, ankle and uh, forefoot and then similar for the right side. So inside the structure, you'll see all those uh, par parameters that were pre-processed and um, ready now to, to, for the analysis. Um, it was down sample to 250 Hertz, and this is kind of um, merged now with the EG um, data sets. What we need to observe here, and I wasn't here while, while measuring this thing, and Klaus showed yesterday, is that um, somehow when we will interpret our results, uh, that this walking was uh, was done during dual tasking. So Betty told you what is dual tasking is basically walking with an additional uh, secondary task. Uh, and here the uh, LED were flashing and uh, they were walking like more, mostly like robots. So you don't see here a very smooth um, 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 this the dynamics of, of um, um, foot and, and uh, hands like swinging. Uh, so they were basically walking, holding those controllers in hands. So that's why I think we can interpret it even um, with a more logical um, you know, uh, perspective, say, having um, or uh, just saying that this gate was a bit slower that uh, we, we can expect in general. Um, OK, and then here are some results from uh, that Klaus showed yesterday. Uh, right, so we have the, um, the um, dual task walking, and we should get the results around one meter per second. So these are the, we, this is the mean of all the participants, and since we have four, part uh, four participants, we may select one of them that uh, you know falls in, inside the uh, this mean area and not having an outlier or something. But in general, like this, this you, you should keep it uh, in mind while interpreting or just checking um, the results that you'll get. Okay, and here we are. So here's the the code that you downloaded. Um, here you can play around just a bit um, with the uh, file path. So change this, as I told you, from uh, five to six. So it's not named anymore like this. But anyway, it's easy to change. And then what you need to know, you have the, the entering point of the data that we, we are going to process, and then the out, output uh, that is going to be saved. Um, and you can name it whatever you want, but it's kind of like events or gate events or whatever uh, you want. So it's in this uh, row uh, num number 14. Then we selected two, two participants. If I'm not mistaken, mistaken the uh, 66 is the uh, older and the 76 is the young participants. Is that correct? Just correct me if I'm wrong, but these are my notes. Um, so then you can continue on. Uh, and here select the option of plotting. So if something goes wrong, um, here you can also select um, like plot to zero. So you won't see any figures in the end. 
uh, you'll get just the results um, and um, or you, you just um, um, select different time frame for plotting. So this could be quite annoying if you plot the whole section of gate. So going up and down, up and down, up and down, and then plotting everything at once. That's why we selected here a random number. So you can change that um, and then try how it works uh, for you. Um, and then it's the, the, the for loop, of course, to um, complete this analysis. Um, in a loop, of course, uh, having lots of subjects at uh, the same uh, time. But I need to uh, comment on that. Um, and again, if you double check the data, you'll see that the, the subject 78, for instance, uh, is, is, uh, is having um, some missing data. So we don't have the, the position of right ankle and we don't have the, the head markers. So that can, could be quite um, annoying while processing in loop. So you do see um, see some errors, or you be, you will basically select then different rows, and this won't end up uh, anymore. So just be aware that perhaps um, you should check the data before you load in loop everything. But we of course um, aim to to record everything in the same way. So um, yeah, this uh, should be resolved in the next um, measurement setups. Um, Okay, so what you will get in the end, and then I'll walk you through um, step by step, uh, row by row uh, in the code. Um, so in the end, you should have like the, the uh, statistical analysis. So it's not uh, nothing statistically uh, like we, we usually do, like uh, comparing uh, multiple subjects, uh, but uh, statistics in terms of like um, having within one single subject, um, having those cycles and then averaging them up and then um, perhaps calculating also the coefficient of variance or standard deviation or other parameters that Betty was showing to you previously. So uh, I extracted a couple of them. You can do that uh, yourself. Once you have the position of uh, those events, it's not the question anymore what you want to calculate out of it. But of course, the general overview for us would be nice to see uh, if the gate speed, for instance, as a general overview of how a participants uh, did was was similar or at least um, kind of like logical if you want to interpret it. I'll come to these figures later on. Um, and here you can see how we extracted this data and in perhaps these, the, the, these were like values um, changed many times. So <laughs> none of them is perfect still, but I think they, they work pretty well. Uh, right now, uh, but if you have any, any other suggestions, we can change them uh, later on, or you can do it yourself. Um, so what you will see, um, let me check. Um, what you will see here, while checking this data, right? If you go into inside the, the structure of move, um, and then channel locations, uh, if you're not, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, if you're not um, um, uh, sure if there is everything in, you should have like uh, 162 rows here and in the subject i guess 78 you'll have only 126 just be aware uh, about that and as same told you uh, you have the oilers um, uh, so here, here x y and z uh, from the orientation in uh, um, radiance and then the position that we will take in meters uh, so you can um, you can work with that so um, yeah just just keep in mind so um, then if, if you want to, and it would be nice uh, just to plot some other things. So just try to, to plot uh, different, uh, different rows and, you know, plot something that would make sense to you and uh, perhaps to, to see it, um, you know, before you start analyzing. So what we can see here already, it's a nice rep repetitive pattern. And one could say that it's very much similar to the one that I showed you on the first slide. However, it's not here. We are taking just the position and nothing else, right? Uh, the position of, uh, if not mistaken, the left ankle, um, and then uh, plotting it throughout the, the whole um, um, gate uh, cycle. So walking up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, while on the other side, on the figure two, for instance, if you select the, the, um, the other row, you'll have the Z position, uh, which is the um, uh, direction uh, in which participants were walking. So that's why you see um, this uh, repetitive pattern again, but you know, going up, down, up, down, up, and down. And then the question comes, how to analyze this data? So 
are we interested into the, the most common um, gait pattern that it's observed like while participants are walking in the park, so for longer distances, or are we interested in the specific turns so that would be even more interesting, for instance, in the Parkinsonians, right? So they, they are having uh, troubles or they can some kind of like freeze while, while turning or while uh, gate init initiating the gate. So it depends what you want to analyze here. And since we have here a healthy uh, population, uh, we decided to select only the stable gate cycles. So we won't be interested into uh, you know, the acceleration part, how you initiate the gate movement and how you end up this movement. So the acceleration on the other side, but just the, the main portion uh, in between. So how you uh, basically uh, do that, um, I'll show you um, now, or that's the, the idea we had uh, in mind while, while thinking about it, right? So. Um, here um, we, um, we we think, and while uh, plotting those data, and uh, after talking with Martin, Betty, um, Klaus, and others, um, we uh, then selected um, these um, just specific um, positions. So we, we we took here the uh, as you can see here the Y um, its left ankle. We even uh, wrote it down um, uh, the the Z. Uh, the Y of right ankle and uh, the Z again of this one or Z in American English. Uh, so what we think here is the um, the, the most re reliable, and you can simply see this pattern occurring, coming and going. So um, with the peak detection, as uh, Anna showed you yesterday already, um, it's a um, kind of like the easiest way we think to extract those events and then shift them uh, according to the biomechanical. Um, position, and then uh, you have the um, initiation of this um, pat uh, pattern or let's say gate cycle. So once again, don't be confused between step length that Betty showed you. It's a step between the left heel strike and right heel strike, while the stride length is the left or right heel strike, and then again, the same side. So you have a double uh, usually the, the times two um, measurement, right? So from step to stride, you get times two in general if your um, gait is symmetric. If it's not symmetric, then it's going to be a bit um, different um, in those two uh, parameters. Um, okay, so here, nothing fancy. You, we select those uh, positions. Um, we uh, we um, smooth a bit the data um, and uh, we continue on. So um, here in the second um, question or the second uh, part, um, uh, we from the road um, 29, we are looking for the local minima and maxima. Um, but again, like from the Z uh, position, again, like when participants were walking in one direction and going down. So this is the, 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 the time point where we basically cut and say, Okay, we are sure that this was a stable gate pattern, and until this moment, uh, where we cut out all the not crap, but you know the the turns and and um, uh, steps that were done at the same uh, place. So yeah, that there are plenty of, of options here. We I, I think very elegant solution that Martin did was like just crossing left and right ankle and then plotting everything up, and you see the mean value and then the, those who are deviating too much, you just delete out or you do it uh, like we do, uh, did it here. So you basically say, okay, this is the, 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 the length of the, the walking on one side to the other, and it should be 10 meters, right? And this should be also seen from your data. So check if the participants from the plot are uh, walking from minus five to five or something like this, because they were you know, uh, starting even half a meter uh, beforehand. So here we selected an arbitrary or let's say uh, a value that you can change, but still it's kind of like approximately 7%. So you, we delete by uh, 15 here, but which uh, ends up approxi with approximately 7% uh, on um, each side, right? And we, we get quite a good um, result with it. Um, and then uh, we, we do here uh, just in the uh, so from 40 on, uh, again, a loop uh, where 
we detect where these cycles were going from um, uh, zero to one, right? We say this is the, the beginning, and then uh, from one to, to zero again, it's the end. So we have a, a, um, a clear cycle, gate cycle. So that means not the gate cycle that Betty was showing before, but the um, gate um, um, uh, walking in one side. So 10 meters one side, and then again, start and end of going, uh, walking back. So these are a bit um, um, yeah, terms that you, you need to be aware of. But um, if you plot them, in, uh, if I show you them uh, later on on the figure, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, OK, and then uh, we named the, the, these uh, um, indices. So turn end, turn start. Uh, and then um, if, um, uh -huh. OK, if, if there are any cycles that are shorter than one third, uh, of the mean. In general, we delete them out because we, we think that there could be outliers. And you'll see in the data that there are some uh, sometimes uh, jumping up and down. So to be sure, we, we delete that uh, out. And here's a kind of like safety uh, mechanism that uh, detects that. Uh, and then we come to the, the, the main part, right? So um, here, we, as I, I told you before, I um, highlighted the, these two rows are basically uh, calling the, the find peaks function that it's embedded inside the MATLAB. Uh, you can play a, a bit around so you can uh, basically select the, the window in which uh, two peaks can occur. And it's very similar as Anna showed you yesterday. So we are checking the events, right? And how with the eye blinks was yesterday in the EG data, here we have in the gay data. Uh, same uh, function used for the peak uh, detection. And again, you get the uh, markers, which are then need to be positioned according to the latency where they uh, occurred. So once we have this latency, we can um, uh, be sure uh, that, that this repetitive pattern was, was uh, going on and we have a very exact position of this event um, in, in general. Okay, and then, um, yeah. Then the, the question here, the main issue of, of this data, right, is about how to uh, select. So I, I plotted again the, the graphics that you've seen before uh, from Betty. So how you basically detect the hill strike. So if you don't have a very clear um, um, you know, uh, foot switch that would say on off response or some other insults that can be put inside the, uh, the, the foot or uh, force plate, which was detecting exact timing when the heel was, was uh, basically striking or uh, yeah, uh, touched the, the ground. So then we can take uh, from the theory of, of biomechanics, right? So we have here the initial uh, contact, the heel strike, as Betty showed you. But then you can see how much time the, uh, here is the um, uh, flat foot, right? And you, you see here until this position when the ankle goes first up. And then on, on this uh, marker, around 60% uh, of the gate cycle, you see that the, there is a toe off um, event, right? And after toe off event, if you look even deeper inside um, the, the, those cycles, you'll see the 65% of that, you see the position of this ankle is the highest and it's a very nicely marked on the um, on the analysis on the graphs that you'll see plotted later on, so that's why if I go back, right, we we kind of like here selected those peaks, but then shifted um, this idea to uh, with um, sixty five percent to say okay this was like a very nicely detected repetitive pattern, but was occurring at the not our um, you know um, uh, point where we would uh, supposed to check this out, but going back um, and calculating and shifting this, this uh, event uh, backwards. So with that, I think we, we end up, that's the, 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 um, the, the, the magic. Um, and we have these events now created. So uh, you have the uh, heel strike uh, of the left foot, you have the heel strike of the right foot, uh, and the um, um, then the uh, statistics that uh, it's basically um, coming up. So, um, yeah. 
okay. Yeah, I'm just checking like um, from the row uh, 109, we have another safety mechanism, right? So um, if you um, get first like uh, left heel strike or um, right heel strike and not turn um, and um, uh, turn start and stop, right beforehand, then something messy was going on. So you should delete that, that power portion out again. So this is just a, a safety mechanism that we, we added and we end up with less events, but again, uh, much more reliable. Okay. Mm, and then, um, yeah, this part you, you've seen, um, it's the creation of the events uh, in, inside the, um, um, that also the EG lab structure that you can uh, use later on that we insert. And uh, we, um, I, I guess Anna can comment or somebody else about the duration. We usually put the zero. Um, here was calculated 0 0.004 something. We uh, left it as it was for eye blinks, but this is not changing much the uh, event. So what is important here is what kind of, uh, so what kind of, uh, what, what type of event was, was happening. You, you see it here. And then what was the latency of this event that you extracted? Uh, so that was written inside this structure. So if you open this up, this should be uh, there now. And the, the only problem, so for, uh, for those who are beginners, um, you once you call the function, you won't see those um, uh, events popping up. So you would need to go manually inside and then um, you know, select and calculate row by row, basically, or, or, or uh, section by section uh, to see it live. You have basically just the, the ending result then saved. So th this could be a bit uh, confusing for somebody who, who just started with that. Okay, and then we have the, the statistics. So you can add your rows or your code here if you want. So we um, here I, I show basically just the uh, turn times, turn length. Um, so some uh, idea of the step uh, and stride, right? Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, in the end you have just an average of the step length. Uh, so not caring uh, or not not questioning ourselves of, of whether it was like left or right foot, or um, then different calculation that I uh, put here. So it's the stride length of left and stride, stride length of the right foot. So you from, from these parameters, you don't have only the average, but you have the left and right. So the symmetries or asymmetries can be easily calculated um, later on. Um, okay, and that's, uh, that's the, the part of the, the statistics. Um, and um, again, we, we have the, the plotting part, which may not work properly. Uh, if you run it um, just um, without uh, checking it, if you have some lower versions of MATLAB, if you comment that out, it should work well, uh, even um, just like creating the, the um, st statistics. Um, and then in the end, you can plot it yourself differently according to the version you have. Um, okay, and then we come to, to the end, right? So we, I hope you, you, you managed to run this script uh, and you got the same results. Um, as uh, I'm showing here. Um, so what you see here, and now you, you, I guess, have a pretty good idea what we were doing. So uh, here you see the, the selection or this gray, I'm not sure if it, you can see it, but it's gray area where, where it's basically signing the starting point and ending point where we cut it out. We didn't plot the, the horizontal uh, uh, line where we cut uh, additional 7% out of it, but you can check later on from the peak detection. So you see uh, from uh, where on those peaks are, are occurring. Um, and then again, cutting um, first, uh, cutting out, uh, then leaving this white area out and then uh, analyzing just this area, this area and so forth. Uh, while on the bottom plot, you can see the peak, peak detection, which um, works quite well. Um, and then again, you know, the, the middle sections, which we don't care uh, about them, um, we, which are turns or basically just simple uh, standing uh, before participants move to the other uh, side, right? So here you can, you can uh, select here and you'll see, uh, to be very honest, um, like we were trying different uh, uh, shifting options. 
um, or just selecting the the the, the one um, you know from the from the peak where the highest position of the ankle was was detected. Uh, but it works pretty well for the uh, younger subject, right? So if you plot this and switch, uh, so uh, shift for 65%, as I said, and I showed you on the graphics, you'll see a very nice, or I think, approximation of where the heel strike should be happening, right? If you if you think about how the, the, the ankle goes down, then uh, it's a uh, first heel strike, the mid face, and then the toe off. Right. So uh, according to that, you, you see here on these graphics, the peaks and then the shifted ones, which are marked with um, uh, other markers, but then are just shifted for the 65 percent of the, the cycle that we calculated according to this uh, subject. And this might work better, like in, in a very constant, like very um, yeah, healthy uh, subjects walking uh, without any secondary task. Uh, but once we 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 uh, deal with the secondary task, you will see also higher variability, right? And also like lower um, uh, gate speed or uh, gate velocity. Um, the same term used differently. Um, okay, I'm checking the timing. I think we are good. Um, so here we are um, then um, saving this data. And if you want to check how this um, data looks like. Just go to the move um, uh, structure. Uh, you open it up, and then in etc. Um, folder, you you find uh, like lots of additional um, analysis. Um, if you, you'll see here, we put here some um, um, like uh, matrices, so you you can basically do it yourself and calculate whatever you want out of it. But we also provided some general. Uh, gate parameters that we think are, um, you know, the most common and just to get an idea what we are uh, dealing with here. And then if we just uh, um, like check those results, if they are valid or if they are deviating out of what we would expect in general, right? Um, you can see here that the symmetry in this uh, subject is it, pretty high, right? For the uh, stride length of left foot versus right foot is uh, 1.55 versus 1.53. So uh, it's very high, but if you check the other subject, you'll see it's uh, quite um, different. So um, the, the asymmetry is, is um, starting to be visible. Um, and then um, you have here um, the uh, variability, so just the simple standard deviation. You can sometimes see also the coefficient of variance. You can calculate that yourself. Um, or uh, then the average step length, which is 0 0.73. So if, you, if I ask you, or usually when we do some analysis, we always try to think whether this is logical or not. And if you think about a healthy adults walking with his uh, preferred uh, walking speed, that would be approximately 1.5, depending if you're rushing or, or not. But uh, then um, uh, also, according to the gate velocity, then the step length would, I guess, increase or decrease, right? If you're walking slower, uh, the, the step length could be. Uh, shorter, not always, but in general, yes. And that's also correlated, hi highly correlated with cadence that Betty nicely explained before. So what is cadence? Cadence is the amount of steps you do in one minute. You can calculate it differently in a second, but usually it's reported as um, the amount of steps in uh, in one minute. Um, and then if you would um, you know, think about it, what is the um, running uh, cadence and what is the Walking cadence, running cadence. It's usually when we correct these um, um, techniques, we should should be around 180 right steps per minute. So it's three steps in one second. So you can calculate that and try it yourself with the metronome, um, or you um, basically go down with the walking, normal walking, fast walking, or a very slow walking, less than one uh, meter in one second. Uh, so you'll see. Um, from from that perspective, and to my surprise, when I, I checked this data first, uh, and I didn't know the background, right? How this was recorded, um, what um, what kind of subject they were, uh, were they walking uh, while talking or walking while uh, using the secondary task, uh, whatever? Um, I I saw, oof, yeah, and I said uh, it's a bit low the result. However, 
uh, if we know all those details, I think it's pretty uh, valid and uh, something that we would expect in general. So um, then in these um, last two slides, I'm basically just showing um, the uh, comparison. So we have here the um, older participant. Um, you see here also from the values, if you take the gate speed 0 0.9 versus 1.06 um, in um, a younger participant, still slow, but uh, yeah, it's dual tasking. Um, and uh, also the, the, as the gate speed increase increases, also cadence increases, as you can see here. Uh, on the right side, right? So if you compare uh, those um, two guys together, uh, you get um, just the first impression how um, this, this uh, should be compared, but it would be super interesting to have also the uh, single task walking, right? Of each of those two uh, participants and then calculate the costs uh, perhaps of, of walking while talking or walking while doing the secondary task. So these are all the calculations that can be then taken into perspective. And then instead of having four conditions, so single task uh, and dual task of uh, younger, single task and dual task of uh, older, you can compare um, the uh, dual task cost of younger versus older. So you have only one comparison uh, to do. And as Klaus showed you uh, yesterday, I think this is from Jana's uh, paper. Um, it's um, yeah, kind of like a valid uh, result that we calculate out of these uh, events. So you see here that the mean value for the dual task walking for uh, the young participant, it's close to one, perhaps a bit above, and then uh, a bit uh, close to the mean value, close to one or be, uh, below for the um, uh, older participant. So these results kind of like yeah, uh, uh, match with, with, with the results of Yana, which is always good to see. Um, okay, and then just the, the last comparison before I, I uh, leave the floor again to Betty. Um, here, again, I'm, I'm showing the same slide as Betty showed you. So we always want to, to have some normative data. So if we want to compare uh, if our uh, results are valid and somehow um, good to, to operate and continue with them, uh, you should compare them with the, the normatives. Uh, and as you see here, for instance, here, here we have the velocity in meters, meters uh, in, uh, in a second uh, per second uh, for young adult in dual tasking. And then uh, for older adult for dual tasking, you see those results are a bit higher than ours, but again, different modality of dual tasking uh, and different subjects um, not having, I guess, uh, controllers in their hands or perhaps, yeah, um, different ones. So um, it, it, it varies um, through uh, setup to setup. Um, okay, and with that, I think, um, yeah, it's the, um, the, the amount of information I want to, to show you. I hope um, Martin will um, then use this successfully uh, for his analysis and uh, show you some more interesting uh, results connecting this gate data uh, with uh, EEG uh, measurements. So Betty, I think um, I, can, I can answer some. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So are there any questions or can you just pick up and repeat? Because I see there are lots of them. Uh, Saying, I guess. Yeah, thanks a lot, Urvash, uh, for the really awesome hands on session. Um, if there are any questions, um, I don't see any on Discord or on Zoom chat. Um, so um, you can just uh, unmute yourself and speak up if you have any. Okay, I see. If not, <laughs> I have a question. Um, yeah. So like uh, you're uh, co comparing these uh, gate related parameters uh, between subjects. So here we have um, the old and the young group. Yes. And um, they happen to uh, match in their biological sex. So they are both male participants. Okay. So if you were doing this comparison uh, with different demographic uh, profile or different height potentially or different body size, um, um, do you expect this to be relevant for this kind of analysis? Maybe this is a trivial question, but no, um, it's it's not. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. Thanks for uh, the question. So, um, yeah, you can you can do many things. So uh, here, usually, like the um, uh, measurement we take always while doing the gate analysis 
is the um, length from the great trahanter, right, from the hip, and then down to the floor. So you would basically calculate the, um, um, the length of your um, lower limb, or let's say, because you know that the left and right can be different. Specifically, we were doing the hip uh, arthroplasty studies and so on, so they can vary. But the, the idea here is that uh, you no, uh, so normalize the uh, could be even gait speed uh, or step length according to the uh, height uh, of the subject. So uh, if you want to be sure that the height is not influencing your gait speed, because the um, you know, the person who is uh, taller could, 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 could walk faster because of uh, having longer, um, longer um, legs. Uh, in general, uh, you can control for that. So, um, yeah, and uh, if you're asking about the, the uh, sex comparison, um, then there, there are studies um, out there like showing, um, you know, comparing both uh, genders or sex. Um, these um, are uh, showing um, like not very consistent, I would say, in the older age, but sometimes you see, uh, at least from our cohort study that we did in, um, in Copper, we're, we're very active, but um, like ladies were having a much faster gait speed as compared to men, which was kind of like surprising to see in general, they were much um, like uh, their height was, was lower. So uh, yeah, in general, it depends what you want to do, if it's a cohort study or if it's just uh, cross-sectional or um, yeah, interventional. Um, so did I answer or? Yeah, yeah, th that was a, a really good answer. Um, yeah, but uh, when you are um, recruiting participants already, um, like with lower sample size, would it be useful to like um, match them when you are doing old young group comparison, match them in height maybe, <laughs> or would it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good question. I guess, yeah, uh, Betty can comment on that. Um, she, she's having lots of experience in that. Um, I think um, it depends. So uh, what, what you want to look at, right? So mm -hmm. if you are very much interested how the height influences the, the um, like could be, as you know, the, the um, height could influence the, the uh, motion. So we see much more body sway of those persons who are um, like taller. Um, uh, so uh, their center of body mass is swaying much more. They're closer to the ground. Um, so yeah, that would be a nice matching point. But uh, in general, if you want to get the, um, you know, average population or general population, I wouldn't do that. I mm. wouldn't uh, select them according to their height. Uh, okay. But if you want to compare them like uh, two pairs of them, then then yes. Like, yeah, uh, if you have patient if you versus... Can afford to do this and maybe it would be a plus, yeah. yeah. And another um, question about uh, the design of the experiment. So um, here we are comparing the baseline task where they are actually, so by baseline, we refer to a condition where the participants are standing and uh, performing only the cognitive task. And then dual task, um, this is dual because now they start walking. So from design perspective, um, depending on what kind of data you focus on, um, if you are if you want to compare um, the gait profile um, during dual task versus single task, then uh, the baseline condition would be participants actually walking without doing the cognitive task, right? So I, I um, find this a bit interesting uh, because uh, this changes the design of the experiment entirely, depending on uh, which aspect you want to look at. So. Yep. Um, yeah, and one very important aspect that we, uh, I'm not sure, never discussed with Betty before, but now it's the time, I guess, um, is also comparing, like, uh, from my studies, previous studies, uh, I always observed very interesting effects. So whenever we were measuring the self-selected speed, and uh, if the effect of training or intervention was very low, you, you didn't get any effect at all. So um, it was kind of like hard to see any effects over there. But once you, you motivate or you push those, those participants to the, their limits and you say um, you, you select a fast paced walking speed, right? Um, you uh, then certainly they're walking as fast as they, uh, they, they can. And then you, you add in secondary tasks, which would influence even more uh, their, their walking ability. But the, the, the answer I wanted to give you here is that we shouldn't mix 
the, the, uh, we shouldn't randomize the self-selected speed with fast-paced uh, speed, because if, if participants are walking in a fast-paced speed and then they, uh, you say, now it's self-selected, they will usually walk much faster as compared to just starting with their self-selected. So whenever you're measuring self-selected and fast-paced, it should be self-selected and then fast-paced. But mm -hmm. when you are measuring single task versus dual task, this should be mixed, right? So it shouldn't like be all participants starting with single task walking and then going uh, and then dual task walking because they are having previous experience with single task. I guess it's obvious from the uh, experimental point of view. But um, um, so to, to answer this question, I guess this is the, the mixture between single task and dual task and then fast paced, uh, single fast paced. Uh, based uh, uh, dual task. Um, and uh, regarding the, the baseline, I, I always collect also some baseline uh, data collection in terms of I introduce them to the secondary task. So they either sit or stand while doing the secondary task. And then they have randomized single task walking and dual task walking. So they never start with dual task walking, not knowing what they need to do, right? So you, you can collect this baseline um, cognitive data and then walking while doing this secondary cognitive task and then compare this and out of it you can calculate um, uh, like several other parameters but I think that's that's my opinion and I am really um, wondering what Betty thinks behind me uh, mm -hmm. about that oh yeah is, is Betty on yeah, yeah. Betty's here <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll be here uh, and I can answer some other questions, but uh, I need to um, uh, give the, the, the floor to Betty to continue and uh, finalize the, the future. Sure, data. yeah. All right, we still have like uh, half an hour, so um, I wasn't sure uh, how it's, so how far we are along your session. So yeah, okay then. Welcome back, Betty. Hi. So if it's um, of interest, then we can. Um go on discussing this idea how to do this experimental setup before I come to the future direction. So um, it is always good to have like um, the single task walking, but also a baseline for cognitive performance, because um, when we want to calculate the dual task costs or the dual task reductions, decrements, whatever, then we also need um, the, the um, dual task cost of the cognitive data. And this is what a lot of us missed in the past. So we should report on what is the single task cognitive performance while sitting, even if sitting might be just some kind of energy <laughs> ex, um, exposure, but um, like what's happening under a condition where we are not walking. And um, that this, this should be sitting because if we do it while standing, then we have to integrate balancing while standing if it's for a longer period. So single type cognitive performance while, while sitting and then um, doing the, the cognitive performance while, while walking. And then we can control about what is going on because a lot of people are um, more interested in the cognitive task while walking than in the walking task while walking. While walking is something uh, which is really a highly automate, uh, automatic um, pattern. And um, the people try to do their very best in the cognitive task. And this is why they will have gait decrements. But when we want to look and um, differentiate maybe between younger and older adults, then the cognitive performance um, in the behavioral data might also show some, some differences. So then we should also control for the, the cognitive performance because we will see, or we might see some differences between sitting and walking as well. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, okay, would you like to go on with uh, some more slides? There are not so many slides. So if there are some questions from, from the audience regarding this dual task experiment, I would be happy to answer more because this is what I'm doing like during the last 10 years, but I can also go on with the, with the slides. Yes, but how? I need to go over here. Check here. Check. Yeah. 
Ah, okay. So what do we need to um, keep in mind if we want to gain more and um, comparable data for the future? Um, we need to integrate additional aspects of um, gate stability or gate quality into our um, research setups. So it's always a good idea to include the arm swing to um, see what is um, going on within our gate and how is the arm swing related to a stable gate pattern or not. Because when you look at um, walking, then we know that um, every step forward is something like a, similar, a single fall that will be um, compensated within the next step. And um, this is um, accompanied by the arm swing and the amount of arm swing um, maybe give us additional information about the quality of what is happening in the lower limb. And also um, it might be a good idea to include sensors for the hip rotation because this will um, give you more insight about what is going on in the hip and what is going on within the initiation of the next step and if there might be problems um, during the different phases um, of the movement. And also we, you ask about, or someone ask about um, the um, dual task manual performance measurements when the people um, have an additional motor task. And um, I refer to these kind of experiments um, with like holding a tray or holding a cup of water um, when the people are moving forward and especially older adults change their whole body movements if they have to do this task because they don't want to spill over something or they don't want to lose something from, from that tray. And then they are doing like this and keeping the, the head in front of the bodies, something like if, if they want to be as fast as they could over the, the goal line uh, um, of a hundred meter task, you know? So, so um, these kind of experiments might change other body segments according to gait, and this will have an influence of the, the balancing aspects of gait, especially like the double support times and all these aspects. So um, sensors for the head movements um, might be good. And then you can also look at something like postural sway in the different directions like um, anterior, posterior or medial lateral. And this will also help to understand to um, differentiate between what is happening within an unstable gait pattern. Is it the um, anterior posterior directions or is it the medial lateral direction, which cannot be um, compensated by the, the change of gait patterns. And I guess we have referred a lot about the uh, measurements of the heel strike and the toe off to gain a really good picture and a really good like um, synchronization of the gait patterns and the EEG data, um, we should um, look from the, the heel strike until the, the toe off within um, our gait cycles to have a clear picture what's going on there. And what we need to do is um, to secure that there might be a proof of measurement accuracy and um, what you can see here um, under, uh, um, what you can see here, this is like from, yeah, no worries. Um, um, do you, are you using like a cursor or? Yeah, that's here. Ah, yes, what you, yeah, there it is. Um, what you can see here is that there might be differences according to what kind of uh, measurement system do you use. And um, we compared like five different uh, measurement systems for um, gate analysis. And um, when, you when you use these kind of measurement systems that are really um, able to detect the heel strike and the toe off in a um, huge or large quality like the, the gate right or like the object gate or like um, treadmills with sensors in it, then you have like more 
um, accuracy and reliable gate patterns than when you use the IMU um, systems or um, these um, other kind of um, accelerometers because it's they are starting from from the the positioning within um, um, yeah different kind of coordinate um, systems and um, the placement of the the accelerometers and their um, referring to the real measurement point have a higher trade-off and then it's um, harder to identify the real um, moment of the heel strike. And this is what we um, might look at that when we want to um, have like more insights um, into destabilization or stabilization phases of the gate, then we might also look at the gate cycle stride time. We can look at um, what is happening within um, the foot positions and um, the accuracy of the foot positions, as I told you, or as I showed you within the slides for the Parkinson disease. So here we can see um, a lot of compensational movements according to different kinds of problems. And this might be interesting how they are connected to what is happening in the brain. So here are a lot of aspects that need to be um, researched in the future. And I would be happy to do this. And um, yeah. And if you want to do this with these like um, IMUSE um, research, something like that, then you need to be aware that um, the positions um, need to be secured. And what we talked about, um, what Sane asked before, we need to look um, where is X, Y, and Z, how we can define a good position, how we can we recalculate a good position. And um, it would be um, really, um, yeah, interesting to, to see um, what is happening in the referring EMG measurements and the EEG measure, measurement in the future regarding different kind of ex, um, um, different kind of um, gait patterns with different kind of pathologies or other movements. So the combination will be um, the run for the future. And um, this is where I wanted to add. Uh, end and um, would thank you from, from our side and there are still or well, there is still a lot of time for questions I guess.